Days. At the Morisaki Bookshop, Part 2. Chapter 2, I didn't oversleep again after that day and somehow figured out what to do in the store. Fortunately, business was mostly slow until the afternoon. I would sit at the counter in the back and zone out. My routine didn't change much once I'd settled in. I would open up first thing in the morning, tend the store until my uncle arrived and relieved me of duty. Then I would trudge upstairs, bury myself in the covers of my futon and sleep. My room contained only the absolute bare necessities. I'm sure it wouldn't have looked like much of a life to anyone else, but it suited me. Honestly, in my frame of mind, I was ready to leave behind the things of this world. My uncle Satoru would appear after noon, dressed in the slouchy, loose clothes that would never have been allowed at a normal company. When he came in, he would first check the account ledger and then the online orders before getting on the phone to chat about something or other for work. I could hear him complaining to the person on the other end of the phone, saying, Nah, no way. Or, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Or, if we don't make it through this. He might have been complaining about the situation the business was in, and yet something about the tone of his voice always seemed happy. What I didn't expect about the used book business was how big the network was. According to my uncle, the network of booksellers and your personal relationships were a big part of making sure you could bring in new inventory and keep the store from running out of books. A specialty store like the Morisaki Bookshop couldn't maintain its inventory just by buying books that customers came in to sell. The periodic auctions that the bookstore union organised were crucial for stores to get more used books. Even though we think of it as an independent business, what matters in the industry more than anything are the relationships you have with people. I guess that's probably true of the world in general, he said, looking rather pleased with himself. There was still a considerable gap, however, between the man proclaiming this to me and the image I had in my mind of a second-hand bookshop owner that came from my grandfather. My grandfather was hard-headed and inflexible, a man of few words. At family get-togethers, he sat imposingly at the centre of the group, surrounded by all of our relatives. As a child, I was secretly afraid of him, and my grandmother would always laugh and say, He's an old used bookseller, that's just the way he is. But compared to him, my uncle was as flexible and indecisive as a jellyfish. I'd never spent so much time with him before, but the more I did, the more I was surprised by how wishy-washy he was. I even got the wild idea that my aunt Momoko had run off because she'd gotten sick of it. And yet in spite of all that, the regular customers kept coming, ready to chit-chat. The two of us didn't talk much aside from work, but after about a week had passed, my uncle couldn't take it any longer. Takako, he said with an amazed look on his face, all you do is sleep. You're a sleep monster. I must be going through a sleepy phase, I replied coldly. My uncle was just itching to interfere in my life, but I refused to let him draw me out. At 25? That's right, it's like they say, a sleeping child is a growing child. But you have so much time. Why don't you try going for a walk? There are lots of interesting places. Listen, I've been coming here since I was a kid and I've never gotten tired of it. I'm okay. I'd rather sleep. I could tell my uncle wasn't finished talking, but I put an end to the conversation. After that, no matter what he said, I wasn't going to reply. I was as silent as a stone. Deep down, I was sulking. Of course, my uncle must have heard everything from my mother, so he more or less knew what was going on in my life. And yet, despite that, he was just casually bringing up the subject without any consideration. It made me angry. Even our regular customer Sabu seemed to know all about my life. He came in one day and said, Oh, if it isn't the sleep monster Takako. Oh, who told you that? I said indignantly. But of course it could only have been my uncle, the person I was really angry with. That you regularly sleep 15 hours and you're still sleepy? I don't sleep 15 hours, more like 13. When I corrected him, Sabu shook his head in amazement. 
when I was in my 20s, I couldn't spare that much time for sleep. I was always reading. When I decide to sleep, I sleep. You're stubborn, just like your uncle. That's absurd. How could you compare me to that fool? You also have his peculiar sense of humour, Sabu said and giggled. I'm not like him. Please don't lump us together. No, no, don't underestimate him, Sabu said, suddenly turning serious. That man might be a nincompoop, but he's also this shop saviour. Saviour? I replied, my eyes getting wide. That's right, ask him sometime. As he spoke, Sabu gave me a knowing look. Then, to show off a bit, he said, Adios, gave a little wave goodbye and left the store. Who cares, I thought. I have zero interest in whether my uncle thinks he's a saviour or not. All I want is to go back upstairs and get under the covers and sleep. Still, even I was amazed at how sleepy I was. I told Sabu that I was sleeping 13 hours a day, but on days when the shop was closed, I slept all day long. I slept and slept and wished I could sleep forever. In my dreams, I didn't have to think of those awful things. My dreams were like the finest, sweetest honey, and I was like a honeybee, flying in search of more. In contrast, there was nothing good about the hours I was awake. Even though I hated him, I was constantly thinking of Hideaki, the way he laughed, the way he touched my hair. I like everything about him, the way he was a little self-centred, the way he had a complex about being tone-deaf, the way he cried so easily. I knew I was being an idiot, but when he and I were together, I truly was happy. And those memories were engraved into the cells of my brain so deeply I couldn't erase them. Sometimes I even imagined that the words he said to me the last time were all lies. That he was just teasing me. It's all fake, he'd tell me. He'd just wanted to play a little joke on me. And of course that wasn't true. If it had been true, I wouldn't be here. So to put it out of my mind and stop remembering what happened, I went on sleeping, perhaps out of stubbornness, perhaps for some other reason. The time passed by so quickly that I could never catch up.